an old and intimate relationship with a city can seem like a long lost love affair. You look back upon it with great tenderness. I first came here to Vienna soon after the war. I was just a baby at the time, of course, and I was tremendously happy here. And so it then seemed to me was almost everyone else, despite the destruction and the plunder, despite the desperate economic situation. Visitors and Viennese alike, we'd all lived through a war and we were ecstatic just to be alive. There wasn't much food, but there was a little new wine. And more important, there was the certainty of seeing a new day tomorrow. So today, when I come back to Vienna, even if it's raining, and it usually is, or it's hot and humid, and it sometimes is, even if I can't find an hotel room, and I never can, and prices are sky high, and they always are, well, even then, those old memories come flooding back. And for me, Vienna can do no wrong. Once upon a time, their very first psychoanalyst discovered sex. And they all felt so guilty about it, they sent him, if not to Coventry, at least to exile in London. For the Viennese never cared to face reality. They still cultivate their own legends and belief. Still act out their lives in a rich and reassuring dream of yesterday, when theirs was the home of the rulers of Europe. Today, Vienna remains an unreal capital, frozen in imperial memories of Congress dancing in blossom time, while up in the Vienna woods, the widow made merry with chocolate soldiers. In this last romantic city, surrounded by such barockery, you search for singing choir boys on white stallions eating chocolate cake. The past seems more real and closer than today. For Vienna ruled many millions for six centuries, yet now controls only a tiny republic with a population far smaller than London. But having lost its empire, this bittersweet city's learned how to be unimportant and like it. Yet amid such serene splendor, today can still intrude. My dear friends, for 150 years, as the man said, their waltz king, Johann Strauss, was born just 150 years ago in this musical metropolis, which for centuries gave the world its composers. Today, in a damp Kirtnerstrasse, they stand to soak up some old familiar magic. Amid such sodden rapture, it's easy to believe the Soviet embassy here can influence people and pay off informers by handing out good seats at the opera. Strauss waltzes still whirl around the world, for he gave Vienna its unofficial anthem, the Blue Danube, and in turn is given as serious a hearing here as such older citizens as Haydn and Mozart, Schubert and Beethoven and Brahms. Austria today has no rich and no poor, no slums or minorities. It's a reasonable and peaceful place. The contented Viennese and the more easily influenced visitors eat all day long. Five meals, usually, with a restoring snack or two snuck in between. Today, they count their blessings, not their calories. The city has 800 parks with seats for 92,000 and an endless supply of carbohydrates. After the 1918 war, the body of the Habsburg Empire was dismembered, but Vienna, its heart, still beats. In three-quarter time, of course. Emotions can be turbulent behind this frivolous facade. The Zakatorta War between Daimel, Vienna's old and elegant pastry shop founded by the chef of an emperor, and Saka's Hotel has finally come to an end after 25 years. And most of those who come here to enjoy the spoils of victory don't realize the turbulent emotions that were aroused by these 25 years of conflict. 
a conflict which, it appears, is about to break out again. Now, Saka Torta, as you know, is a slightly overrated chocolate cake with an apricot jam filling. You'll normally see a, a Viennese behind one of these, and it's usually held down by lashings of whipped cream. It's not my favorite dish, but now and then I can force myself. So, the Saka Torta War. Anna Saka, the formidable cigar-smoking matron who founded this hotel and presided over it, died in 1930. And her heirs discovered, to their horror, that her husband, Edward Saka, the chef, had sold the recipe for this Saka Torta to Damon, the competitor. And needless to say, they took a lawsuit immediately, and the Vienna courts, realizing the importance of this matter, heard endless evidence, deliberated, as indeed they should have deliberated, for 25 years, and finally handed down their verdict. And this is it. Sarkas is the only one who may cook the original whole Saka Torta, with a round chocolate label on the top, and two layers of apricot jam. Damon, on the other hand, could only cook small, individual Zaka Torta. And I've smuggled a couple of Damal Torta in. Tell me if anybody's coming. And here they are. Small, round, with a triangular badge on the top, and only one layer of apricot jam. So, after 25 years of holding its breath, Vienna can now settle back and uh, relax and enjoy it. With the chance, of course, that in a few years' time, Damals will appeal and the whole thing will start again. With pastry bigger than a bedsheet, lighter than ectoplasm, they're about to create before your very eyes the biggest apple strudel in the world. Twice in the past 60 years, this sweet life's been violently turned upside down. The Austrians were on the wrong side in two wars, which didn't help, so the old anxieties Freud dragged to the surface still agitate. Their calm, secure capital has improbably the highest suicide rate in the Western world. And in peaceful avenues which know no crime or dissent, little old ladies can shake sticks and wave fists. And like everywhere else, it's wiser not to argue with a uniform. The father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, lived and worked in this street for 47 years amid hostile indifference from the Viennese. And when the Nazis banned his science, he fled to England. But in the Berggasse, he's still a man of tomorrow. Though for the benefit of foreign visitors, the city's made his old home a museum. The gentle head of the Freud Society, Dr. Lingens, was in Auschwitz. This was where the very first couch was. Where the first, very first couch was, yes. Doctor, it, it's very strange that Sigmund Freud's influence upon the world was incalculable, and yet here he was, f until today, unacknowledged and unpopular. Yes, that is true. It was based before the war. Uh, so even even the first years before World War One, it was he was uh, rejected by the very Catholic conservative uh, uh, society because he was uh, in their eyes he was a man who had discovered sex yes. at least it discovered that one could speak openly about it and that was uh, uh, gave a shock to this society. If you see, Vienna has had a reputation of, of ignoring or even attacking 
It's talented sons and yeah. daughters. Oh yes, for that, that's uh, uh, for all talented sons and daughters. They don't like people to differ too much from the average. You see, but especially if this is now accompanied by the great son being a Jew, uh, it makes it even more difficult for the general population to accept. You see, his findings uh, upset the beliefs and the practices yes, yes. and the theories yes. of, of the people in the street. So and now it's from, uh, from the point of view of the man in the street, it's, it's uh, come home, Dr. Freud, all is forgiven. Slowly, slowly. In this straight-laced Catholic city, Dina LaRotte successfully sells a sort of eroticism. Sketches around 200 pounds, paintings up to a thousand. Now you see, your painting, this is what, uh, <laughs> buy Toulouse-Lautrec out of cabaret. Uh, what, what, are you, what are you trying to achieve from, from Crystal? A woman with a black hat and the boots, that's a woman who, she's look like a little cruel. A woman who destroys the man. You want to do this? She's okay, very... I like this so much, it's hmm. beautiful. They can draw in, a, in this way, it's fantastic. She hasn't got much to do with uh, Johann Strauss, really. <laughs> no, <laughs> I will <feel> not. <laughs> but it might be that Johann Strauss would have been fascinated from this her. disciple of Kokoschka and Klimt creates a certain sweet decadence quite out of step with Vienna. You dropped a drawing pen. Oh, as I do always, it's very dangerous here in this room for models who are going without shoes. <laughs> it's lucky you like boots. <laughs> yeah, yes. Like near my. See, I'm just surprised to, to run across you in, in a, a city that always seems to me to be the most unsexy city in Europe. Uh, do you believe that we are so much unsexy? Well, I'm sorry about it, but I can't change it. Unerotic, <laughs> unerotic, I think, perhaps. No, yeah, that, that depends of, of, the old, of the old people who are living in this town. And they have become unerotic because they are all unsatisfied with their own life. If they would have had a uh, happy life, they would change their mind. But the most of them are unhappy, that is. And uh, the young people um, um, are very very uh, puritanic also because they learn it from their parents and it is very already the young people are old when they when they are born with any luck we'll all be old one day yet in vienna it sometimes seems it's happened already a quarter of the population's over 60 so the place can look like a sprawling old folks home a pension opera Distrusting progress, they still hear that old Habsburg hymn calling for the preservation of the Emperor, which Germans know as Deutschland über alles. In the last 60 years, the population's decreased by a third. Vienna must be the world's only capital in these days of population explosion to grow smaller and older. Doctor, Vienna is an old and grey and a tired city, and the Viennese seem to be grumpy and cranky and, and melancholy. You're a man who's lived around the world and you've been to most of the major cities in the world. What is it that, that drew you back here? I think because it is, if one would use a fashionable word of today, a city which offers more on quality of life than others. It's a city where the old are still in charge. Other cities, the youth has taken over. Here, the old people still run things, and they run things the way they want to run. I think that's a very exaggerated statement. But you've got 700,000 pensioners. <laughs> no. But they don't run the city. <laughs> the, the mayor of Vienna is a young man. Yes. With other words, it is a young generation which has taken over all So one functions. person in every four is an old age pensioner. That's well, an elderly city. That is the effect of the war. Victor Grun spent his first 35 years here, then escaped from Hitler to the United States. The effects which will exist for the next 10 to 20 years will be, there will be a large, overaged, a, a population. He returned as a leading town planner to live here and to advise on the transformation of the city centre which has meant banning cars and building an underground railway. 
You see, I find it very hard to adjust to the fantastic upheaval that the underground has caused here. That, uh, that in order to preserve Vienna, you have uh, you have made the city suffer for ten years, have you not? For a city, which is with a history which goes back 2,000 years, it certainly pays to sacrifice 10 or 20 years of our people in order to improve the city because it's a small a time section of the entire life expectancy of the city. You see, I had no idea. I know in London where they're building the Victoria Line, they take a modest little corner of Green Park and they, they go down and underneath they burrow away. But here you unzip whole streets. Stephansplatz, the Piccadilly Circus of Vienna, and once a graveyard. To build their underground, they tunnelled within a couple of metres of this Gothic cathedral, which survived, though only just, the bombs and battles of the war. Fortunately, St Stephen's nurtures a patron saint and protector. Not a mad organist, but a sort of recording angel. His bell has not yet tolled for these subterraneans whose advance of ten yards every day, deep beneath the cathedral, is monitored up here. Herr Liebscher is the engineer who records vibration and can halt tunnelling should the 700-year-old fabric tremble. For a bird's-eye view of the cataclysm which has hit Vienna in the name of progress, I went into space in that insecure cage. That cathedral means a lot to the people of Vienna, does it? Yes, it's the heart of the, uh, it's the heart of the city, and it is in the heart of the people of Vienna. So you have a very delicate work here. Yes, it's a psychological delicate work. I mean, it's hard to understand why you had to use this open cast construction, and that you couldn't have just uh, found a, a park uh, like Green Park. This seems to be a good moment to tell you that I'm very frightened of heights. <laughs> you see, I first saw that cathedral when I came here in, in 45, when it had no roof and it was, it was just a ruin. Aren't you terrified that what you're doing now could leave the cathedral in the same way? No, no, never. But you had 12,000 people buried down here at the time of the pestilence. Yes. When you were, when you were digging, didn't you... Uh, well, we found some boats and so... But if, 12, if there are 12,000 skeletons down here... Yes, it was not... Uh, there were, it was not so much. And the most of them, I mean, there was no skeleton or here. There were only dust. Were any of the workers a bit superstitious uh, or fearful? of working amongst the dead? No, no, no. It's usually in Vienna you can find very often some, uh, some graves and some uh, deads in the ground and uh, if you make a few uh, in other works you always find them. Vienna's joy of living blends with its death wish. So the historic trappings of the grave are on display in the Macabre Municipal Funeral Museum. Among the exhibits, the contribution made to the Austrian way of death by the Emperor Joseph II. He decided, he made a law, and five men came with a coffin in the home of the dead man, and then they put it in the coffins, and now something very uh, um, interesting is happening, just for saving the coffin for the next funeral and for the next man who will die, the fifth man was just standing here, he made so, and then the body just fell in the grave. But even today, it seems that the Viennese, with their well-known melancholy, do look forward to death. Yes, I would say yes, and it would be a mistake to think that the Austrians feel only well or feel only gemütlich, um, outside in the vineyard after having drinking a few glass of good new wine. No, uh, they have a kind of uh, gayness which is full 
not only in, of melancholy, but a kind of, I could say, a preparation. They, they, they want to be ready when, when they have to go. And of course, unfortunately, the majority of the people, when they come to Vienna, they, they hear the songs and they are singing. But the words, this is so fascinating. Those very simple folkloric songs, and most of them deals with saying goodbye, being ready, going away. You know, there were many people who were afraid to be buried alive. So they had something very exquisite. They put a bell with an underground wire, and then in a room where a man lived, this was a totem engraver. The death watcher. Can I show you just a minute how it was? I'm the dead, I'm the you, corpse. You, you, uh, <laughs> So now, and then if uh, somebody would awake, Let he would move a little bit, please. And what would happen? Yeah, what would happen? Oh. I'm alive, I'm alive. And I'll be back with you in a couple of minutes. Uncertain of today, much preferring yesterday, the Viennese, with their streak of gentle hopelessness, are also drawn towards the somber tomorrow. They appreciate cemeteries, not mournful places, but somewhere to sit and enjoy the scenery. They call a corpse a 71, the number of the tram that brings you to this array of monumental masonry, which they say is half as big as Zurich and twice as funny. This biggest of Vienna's 50 cemeteries, the central, is a vast suburb of death where two million lie buried. Their number growing by more than a hundred every day, so there's always plenty to watch. Viennese will save for years to leave the world in style. Their Habsburgs set an imperial example, of course, going to their graves in triplicate. Their bodies to the Capuchin vaults, their hearts to St. Augustine, their intestines to the catacombs of St. Stephen. The composers, Vienna's pride, lie clustered together in a reverential glade. They were buried all in one piece. Here, amends have been made to the shade of Mozart, lost in 1791 in an unmarked grave. The family of Dr. Eugene Danner invited us to join them today. He's accompanied to his resting place by moonlighting singers from the state opera. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and the customary tip changes hands. Not another shroud in preparation, but part of the uniform of certain grave diggers and chimney sweeps, magicians and diplomats. The very last top hat factory. Vienna's one of the few remaining homes of craftsmen. 150,000 small businesses making things like petit point and rocking horses. In London in 1791, one of the first top hat wearers set dogs barking and women fainting, so was heavily fined for causing public unrest. 
Today, it takes this last mass producer of silt toppers more than six hours to complete one gleaming beauty, which will cause no alarm, Ooh. but will cost it's the assured time. man who'll wear it anything from 40 to 80 pounds. So they still turn out 20,000 a year, most of them bought by sharp dressers in New York's Harlem, but whatever you might expect, they don't last a lifetime, because after all this trouble, people will sit on them. Oh, it cannot fit. I cut it out and show you exactly how your head is. It's a curious looking shape. It's hard to believe that my head is that sort of... Every head is different. So, now you can look your head. That's the shape of my head? Yes. You've got to be joking. And the normal, the normal head? It's not in this line, it's a round line. And so we must make exactly, with the small machine, how your head is. What do you believe, Mr. Habig, that a top hat does for a man? I think many things. If you are a small man and you have a nice girl who is a little bit bigger than you, <laughs> and you put the top hat on and then you are a little bit bigger. <laughs> if Be you are big... better, than, better than elevated shoes. You mean. <laughs> I think so, yes. Yeah. The police, I believe, originally wore them in England, at any rate, the peelers, to protect their heads from things being thrown at them from windows. Now, it may be that if you wear a top hat, you're going to need protection. <laughs> The sight of a top hat used to spread fear in Vienna, for it was standard headgear for the Emperor's secret police. So in this home of Freudian angst, the harmless old hat became known as an anxiety tube. Wonderful. Oh, I think you look 20 years younger. <laughs> it may make you feel distinguished, but it tends to make you look a bit of an idiot. The inevitable sounds of Strauss were swamped in the 30s by the discordant years. With soup kitchens and fighting in the streets, the Nazis, the war, and then, as poor man of Europe, with unemployment and ruinous inflation. If such depression sounds unhappily familiar to us today, it's encouraging that Austria's risen from ruins to riches. It may be trapped in waltz-time memories of imperial grandeur, but the gross national products increased five times in the last 20 years, so it hasn't been dancing all the time. Vienna's most successful publisher, Fritz Molden. I think we are dancing comparatively little. I, I would almost say we are dancing much less than our friends in Britain do. And we're working more. And one of the reasons why we are better off is that we are working quite a bit. Uh, the Austins work, uh, I would think, next to the Swiss. But Austins work most in Europe. Uh, the Austrians uh, talk all the time that they really want to dance and eat cake. But uh, in order to dance and eat cake, they have learned they have to work hard. Because uh, they lost everything twice, once in 1918, when the old empire broke down, and once again in 1938-45 in the Second World War. So, twice, this uh, nation had to get on its feet again and uh, get on its feet on its own. The thing that's very noticeable here is the fact that workers and management get on together when in the rest of the world, yeah. and, in, and in Britain in particular, workers and management are at each other's throats and it seems will be indefinitely. Whereas here, I think this is a consequence of the wartime and post-war period. After the war, this country was occupied uh, by four powers and during the war it was occupied by one power, but all these powers were foreign powers. So uh, there was a tremendous feeling of sticking together of everybody against the foreign rulers. So there was a, um, a holy or unholy, whatever you want to call it, coalition formed between the employers and the, and the union leaders. And uh, this still goes on. In general, life seems remarkably pleasant here. The Viennese seem to have discovered how to get the best out of life. Yeah, I think the Viennese are, in a way, if you want my frank opinion, a uh, little dull, you know. Uh, they, they drink wine, they listen to music, but they are not very progressive, neither intellectually nor otherwise. Vienna is, most of all, the capital of the Habsburgs. When they ruled much of Europe, Schönbrunn was merely their summer palace. Today, the man who might have been King Emperor of Austrians and the Magyars, the Hungarians, Archduke Otto, lives in a modest house in the village of Pocking outside Munich, which locals call Pockingham Palace. He prefers to be known as Dr. Habsburg. 
He was banished and his family possessions confiscated when he was seven. Now, the Austrian authorities permitted you to return when you relinquished all your claims yes, upon exactly, the throne. Yes, exactly. I understand that your mother, the Empress Zita, did not approve of your decision. Well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. We, oh, we were always in agreement because she understood that I had to do it. But are you not addressed by some people still as uh, Emperor? Well, I have eliminated that as much as possible. And I think I'm fairly successful. I've been fairly successful. I, of course, try to do it in, in the, uh, so as not to hurt their feelings, but uh, it works. It would seem to me that Vienna, which is uh, such a, an old and, and grey and, and baroque city, tends to make everyone, including yourself, look backwards, when I'm sure you'd prefer to look forward. Well, it does, you see. It is a city which, at least at this time, is very much turned toward the past. But this is really the tragedy which befalls all cities which have their wall. You see, uh, we are talking a lot about the wall of Berlin. And we forget that Vienna has had its wall for 25 years, with the one exception that the Vienna wall isn't visible in the city itself, but it's a few kilometers from here toward the Czechs, toward the Magyars. We have here still impenetrable borders. And the result is that Vienna today is a dying city to a certain degree. You see the uh, percentage-wise importance of the old in relations to the young is most unfavorable. And that's quite understandable because the whole movement of the population goes from east towards west. Vienna always lived from the Danubian Basin. As far as human elements are concerned, look at the telephone book. The names are all Czech, Hungarian, Jewish, whatever you want, but it's all names from the, uh, from the Danube Basin. And now this all is cut off. So it is quite understandable that Vienna is a sort of terminal station. And when you come with by railroad or by aircraft, there is nobody who continues beyond Vienna, or nearly nobody. Uh, the last people get off the train here in Vienna. And that, of course, makes that the city is uh, in a very difficult situation. One situation the Viennese have mastered is the art of civilized drinking. The Heuriger, with schmaltzy music in leafy gardens and dirndl serving wenches, is an institution hard to resist. Only here can I be played at and sung at without cringing. Indeed, I've even been known to encourage it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then gibt's auch kein Wiedersehen. Einmal da war es so Winehouses around Vienna have sold the produce of their own grapes since the days of the Roman legionnaires. Their Heuriger wine, the year's pressing, is light and slightly sour and seems mild as lemonade. But those who've earned their morning after headaches make sure to dilute well or, being Viennese, mix with food. Even so, it can hit you behind the knees or uh, go to the eyeballs. On the water meadows of the Danube, six square miles of peace or friends. The Prat, imperial hunting ground open to the public just over two centuries ago by the same enlightened emperor who brought you those reusable coffins. This fairground, in one corner of the park, gave Vienna its symbol, the big wheel, built nearly 80 years ago by a firm of English engineers called Bassett. It kept turning even after a world war, as we saw in The Third Man. Vienna, between east and west, is still the ideal background for such spy thrillers as resident novelists like Sarah Gaynham appreciate. And there must obviously be an awful lot of spies of all colours and sizes and shapes here, but you don't see them in the ordinary, I mean, they don't 
have chases through the opera, like in a James Bond movie or something. And what about the Viennese, the, the character of the Viennese? Uh, one knows about their noted melancholy and their, their cunning. All their songs, yeah. Mm. They slow, they move more slowly than other people, it seems to me. There's a bit of peasant in them still. Because they're very conservative, they don't want a new house every five minutes, or even new furnishings, because they feel uncomfortable with new things. The fact that two-thirds of those houses haven't got bathrooms, I suppose, suggests that their demands are not too high. No, they're not. They don't make great demands on life. <laughs> I don't know to what extent they were, they were shocked into responsibility. I think quite a lot. By Hitler and by I the war. I think quite a lot. And they recovered from all their internal dissensions and things, uh, quite literally, as well as figuratively. In Dachau, where they were all shut up together for several years, all the politicians, I mean, and they've never really quarrelled since. There really are no politics anymore in Austria, not as we understand. And then the Russian arrival, which was even... Ah, well, I was cured of, you know, in, as you will remember, everybody in England admired and even adored, in a sense, the Russians in those days. They were thought to be the, the absolutely splendid chaps. And uh, as is true, that they'd won the war. And that is true, of course. And to see them as they really were was a shock I think I've never recovered from. They didn't behave very well. They looted uh, the part of the country which they occupied, and they raped uh, a few hundred thousand women here. And I would think it's a member of every second family. Every uh, other family in every Vienna. Every other family in Vienna. But uh, subjectively speaking, you don't forget it if, if, if your sister or your mother has been raped. And, and that is something which, in a way, has also helped the basic relationship between the social partners in this country, because it made it impossible uh, to infiltrate for the communists the unions in this country. Because if you are a communist until recently in this country, you were automatically considered a traitor. The occupation ended exactly 20 years ago, and the Viennese watched the Red Army march out. It was the first time Soviet troops had ever given up territory. They left old headquarters where, under the chandeliers in the ballroom of the Imperial, Ukrainian soldiers slaughtered oxen. They left a shattered local Communist Party. The Austrians knew how it felt to live for 10 years with communism. So today, the Communists only get about 1% of the votes. They left this city of statues one unavoidable monument, its permanence built into the peace treaty. And the Red Army is still in Hungary, just a few minutes up the road. In the heart of this self-indulgent city, other monuments to other times, erected by Adolf Hitler. Six anti-aircraft towers built in 1940, which neither Allied bombs nor Russian shells disturbed. Their 16 stories of concrete and steel have also defeated Austrian engineers, for to dynamite them would demolish the surrounding districts. Hitler, who was wrong about almost everything, said his Third Reich should last a thousand years. And as far as this monstrous part of it's concerned, he may well be right. The Nazis drove out or killed most of Vienna's quarter of a million Jews. One of those still here has become the conscience of the world pursuing war criminals the rest of us have chosen to forget. Simon Wiesenthal still believes there's no closed season for Nazis. But his 30-year crusade does not always please the Austrians. Oh yes, sure, they are not happy with me. Uh, they are not because I am disturbing. Uh, I published also the party numbers of uh, members of the government because they had the, the head of the government uh, is a Jew, he say he's a formerly Jew. But we have a few Nazis in the government. You know, this is uh, not a very nice composition. See, with all this gemütlich around here, one tends to forget that, in fact, the Austrians were some of the most uh, avid Nazis of all, the most avid SS men. Uh, you must know, um, the biggest Nazis was coming from Austria. Hitler was an Austrian, Kaltenbrunner was an Austrian, Eichmann was coming to Austria as a child of four years, Globocznik. Uh, Austria was only eight and a half percent uh, from the population side in the greater Germany, but they are Austrians, people from Austria, not Austrian as the population, but people from Austria are responsible for uh, between 30 and 50 percent of all crimes.
the, the staff of Eichmann. 80% was Austrians. Yet Austrians uh, seem to be an amiable and uh, and, the, and the gentle this people. This not, has not, uh, not to, nothing to do with the character of the people of Austria. You can have in every country, you will find people, you know, they are, they can commit crimes. And they was very, very proud. Many of them was proud that Hitler was coming from Austria. Of, of all your, your potential victims, as you seek, are there any in Britain? No. No. We're clean, are we? I don't know if clean. <laughs> we have no information. There was a few little people. A few little people, that's not important. But they emigrate later to Canada. The we have now in the uh, United States, after so many years, we found about between 75 and 80 people. I don't know Akwarat is. Uh, okay. We have a man, he is a bishop in Chicago, a Romanian Orthodox bishop. <laughs> we have pictures of him with a rifle. He was responsible for a pogrom for a mass murdering Jews and Yassi. But he's still a bishop in the meantime. He's a bishop. He's a bishop. We have another man, he's a professor in Los Angeles. Do you feel threatened yourself here? I mean, you have a lot of protection in there. You've got your closed circuit yes. television. Yes. You've got your revolver. Sure, sure. Uh, we are living in a crazy world, as I say before, and we must be prepared. Uh, but are you people. thinking of one madman, or are you thinking of a fact that the people in this square just don't like you and what you're doing? Uh, look, if a man like I is taking all in account, he must close the office and to go for vacations. And I cannot stop because our office is the last office in the world. And if we will close, this all murderers will say, the Jews, they giving up. <laughs> and so I am responsible for their bad sleep in many, many countries. And this is also a part of the sentence. If after 30 years, they cannot rest. And I assure you that no one of the big Nazis uh, since the Eichmann affair is sleeping longer than three months in the same bed. Despite Wiesenthal and his long shadow of vengeance, Hitler's become a sort of silly joke to his fellow countrymen. In the Amhoff flea market, Nazi relics are popular and expensive. How much is that? Yeah. 600. An old iron cross for 16 pounds. Vienna's capable socialist city government has had to find uses for an embarrass of palaces. So, at the Baroque Hetzendorf, concerns itself with frivolity. Teenage students showing what they've learned at this municipal fashion school. Austrians enjoy such parades almost as much as they adore the titles they banned more than half a century ago, though princes and palaces still go together like Wiener and Schnitzel. The RAF bombed this Schwarzenberg palace, but it escaped Russian occupation when the princely family claimed Swiss nationality. So today, in one wing, there's the Swiss embassy, next to a ferociously expensive hotel they've created. Their main palace can be hired by the hour to throw a stately ball or launch a new car. So today's Prince Schwarzenberg can disregard Wagnerian thunder off stage for, like a jolly gypsy baron, he's come to terms with socialism. Apart from this palace, you, you, you've got a castle or two, I believe. Yes, that's right, yes. So although you're not legally a prince, you, you, you're at least a living like one. <laughs> I never still got out what is a legal and what is an illegal prince. <laughs> 
Your position here is a is rather an anachronism, is it not? I mean, you're, well, of course. You're, you're a nobility in a in a socialist city. Yes, well, you see, we are like, like any uh, animals of a dying out race, which are still preserved, be it in a zoological garden or in other or on an island in the Pacific, and sometimes shown to other people. And <laughs> we are well, we are still quite happy to live. You see. <laughs> How is it that you've managed to survive uh, perhaps better than, than your peers, more financially better? Than well, uh, it's very simple because uh, we have something my late un uh, Uncle Henry started uh, uh, with some rooms in the house and then we uh, built it out and so, on, and so it became a hotel during the last year. Now we have achieved what we wanted that the house is keeping itself up, you see? You're saying, for example, that you will never go to, to uh, one of the balls that, that are held here in, in your palace, because if you go to one, you've got to go to them all. Well, you see, I mean, uh, here, if, if somebody gives a ball or a reception or something in the house, I'm an innkeeper like anybody uh, else, you see? And, and it's not normal that the innkeeper go, goes to the party which is given in the house, you see? I mean, I have nothing to do there safe of, of looking that, that the dinner is served in a perfect order. How do you find that, you're, uh, that, that the man in the street regards you now? Yeah. We are a bit like animals of, of, of past the way days, you see. But there are still beasts which are several million years already on this world, like the hedgehog, and still running in every garden. So maybe <laughs> my grandson is like a hedgehog and due to many needles on his back, you see, fighting his way through in a hundred years' time, too. That's right, I hope yes. for him, at least, to yes. be a hedgehog. <laughs> the dinosaur couldn't compete, really, because mm. he, he couldn't evolve. Yes, that's it. But you've evolved uh, remarkably successfully, mm -hmm. and Congress can continue to dance. The shining ballrooms of Vienna now watch the waltz of the diplomats. In case you didn't know, and who did, an international disarmament conference has been going on here for years. Ambassadors from 17 European countries, the US and Canada, have been meeting on our behalf beneath the chandeliers of the Redoutenzaal once or twice a week ever since 1973. Should they ever reach a decision, it could be carried out away across the Danube in that skeletal metropolis. A new UN city costing around 300 million pounds and growing so vast, visitors wonder if it'll be the future headquarters of the United Nations should it decide to wave New York goodbye. After all, the Secretary General, Kurt Waldheim, is an Austrian. UN City will be ready for its staff of 5,000 by the end of 78. So, tucked away at the end of Europe, little Austria, refusing to become a museum, makes itself heard on the international stage. Not by strength of arms, but by determination to be the world's meeting place. Today, on this comfortable and reassuring stage, even visiting Germans must join Austria's theatrical charade. Even its parades can be preposterously unmilitary. Freud may have discovered complexes here, but the Viennese are now more in step, I'd say, than any other capital. For in their city with a lilt, they understand what Baroque really means. An illusion which makes you happy is far better than a reality which makes you sad. 